I don't know if you realize it or not, and it's too late to change it, but since this is in connection with York Fest, what you are missing tonight at 7 o'clock downtown is Peter's One Man Danger Circus Spectacular. I, I hope that's not disappointing to you. And if you get up and leave, I won't be offended. But anyway, it is what it is. Thanks for coming. Uh, we're glad you're here. Um, yeah, I'm excited about this being uh, knowing myself, although it seems like planning this was one of these things where about, I don't know, maybe six weeks ago, we kind of, you ready for this thing? Yeah. Uh, you want to divide up responsibilities? Yeah, we should do that. Okay. And we really haven't ever sat down for any length of time. <clears throat> We've just kind of eventually figured out, well, I'll do this and you do that. Sound good? Yeah, sounds fine. So if this doesn't go well, it's because of a lack of planning. <laughs> but anyway. Um, again, I'm excited because it's the two of us. Uh, he, he is a great young man. Uh, Love him dearly. He's a good Christian man. Uh, his brother raised him right. Um, I, I, I like the service that he puts uh, into the state of Nebraska. He takes it very seriously. Uh, he is your weapons guy. It's always good to have a son, by the way, who's certified in automatic weapons. He hasn't had to come in handy yet, but you know, you never know. You never know. So it's something may come up. So I'm going to start this tonight and kind of stay close to the. Uh, the uh, PowerPoint as I can here, but I'll start here with a real short intro. That is it about the Romans. Uh, in 401 BC, there was a Persian prince who wanted to be the emperor, the Persian emperor. His older brother was the emperor. He wants to be emperor. So he will hire a large Greek army, mercenary take to Persia, fight, win, become the king of Persia. And his brother's expense. He hires a lot of expense. 12,000 Greek mercenaries. Marching into the Persian Empire, they get almost to Babylon and engage in their first fight, in which the Persian prince gets killed. So there you are, deep in enemy territory, with no friends, no leader, and really no good way out except to fight your way out. This army will then begin what becomes known famously as the March of the Ten Thousand. Obviously, not everybody makes it since we started with 12. The March of the 10,000. They will move from Babylon. Already done this. If I could still here, they have to march a thousand miles up to here, fighting their way across enemy territory. Then they have to march 500 more miles just to get out of the empire to safety, slugging their way through enemy territory. And they make it. They survive. And the reason they survive is because of a military tactic called the phalanx. The phalanx is the most organized battle formation in the ancient world. <clears throat> Prior to this and long after this, in the ancient world, when folks went to battle, tribes, whatever it was, very typically they were not that organized. Often you would get, oh, a group of people, they are going to go to war with somebody else, and they would call out, you know, everybody show up, you know, with whatever you got, and we'll try to make it work. Nobody's a professional soldier. Almost nobody's a professional soldier. So they show up. Nobody's got any armor. You know, they got their best suit or whatever. 
They bring Dad's old sword, they bring their pitchforks, they bring a gnarly shillelagh, they bring their ugliest cow, you know, whatever they've got, that's it. Mishmash it together, find the enemy, all the while they're drinking weak beer and, you know, trying to, anyway. They finally find the enemy, they'll run toward each other, maybe if they, you know, they're kind of half drunk half the time, and they just hope they go in the right direction. And that's kind of it. There's not much formation to it. The Greeks changed it. The Greeks were really organized. As you can see here, we're talking about squares of men, often 8 to 12 deep, 8 to 12 wide, 20 one, 22 foot long spears. Everybody's got one. And I mean, look at this thing. You come marching forward in this dense mass of men with these long spears that, you know, the enemy can't even get to you. You're this big hedgehog of 144 guys. It's formidable. And the really cool part beyond just the square organized formation of it is in the ancient world, and this is true really almost in the 19th century, <clears throat> when you had these long lines of men, typically men went to war, met each other on fields in long lines of battle, long lines opposite each other, like long football teams basically, and then they just went at each other. And if you could break up the interior lines, you throw your enemy completely into chaos. And that's what these things do. Sometimes they'll form them into a wedge shape, which is kind of pierced into the side of the enemy line. Uh, and the other really cool thing, too, about the phalanx is if you're in long lines on the battlefield and you're facing north, you're the commander, and for some reason, you, know, you want your line to really face the east, because that's where the enemy's coming from, you misjudged. You've got to turn that line, thousands of men, to the, this direction, which is almost impossible. With the phalanx, you've done it. Your right becomes your front just like that. So you've got the field covered every possible direction. It's fantastic formation. Well, why am I telling you that? This is about the Greeks. By the way, uh, Terry Seifeline, Dr. Sherry, Terry Seifeline, and I are working on a Greek display, uh, temporary display for the museum, which will premiere next March during the Equip Conference. You know what the Equip Conference conference is. Uh, we, he, he's already gone to Greece, so that's how dedicated we are on this one. Uh, he's watched uh, put it, put it together. Um, we thought that was important to do, maybe because historically, you know, you don't know, if you don't have the Greeks, you don't have the Romans. When the Romans come along, which is eventually, because when we talk about the Romans, the Romans weren't always the Romans. If you go way back, let's just remember, the Romans really start being the Romans about 509 BC, when the Republic gets established, they throw out the Etruscans. Kick, 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 clock starts. <clears throat> about 500 years of Republican history, give or take, down to Julius Caesar or Augustus, pick your pick. And then the Empire begins for another 500 years, a thousand years of Roman history. Okay? But before all of that, the Romans were nobody. The Romans were just a little tribal group in the middle of Italy, nobody cared to who's about. Eventually they become an organized village. Eventually they become a town. Eventually it's really centered in a city, state. And of course eventually the Republic and eventually the Empire. To do that, you have to conquer all kinds of folks. And the way they did that in terms of battle formation is going to be by using the phalanx. Now, when they used the phalanx, they adopted and adapted and changed in all kinds of ways. Roman military history is not static. It changes constantly. They're changing tactics, they're changing the size of their phalanx, they're changing the structure on the field, 
it's going to be this pattern, then this pattern, and bigger groups, and smaller groups, and it, it changes constantly uh, as they adapt to all sorts of field experiences along the way. So they're really great. Of course, the Romans borrow constantly from everything. You know, they steal uh, language, and they steal art, and they steal architecture, and they steal law. Uh, they, they steal all kinds of stuff, including how to fight. Now, we can get into really tall weeds on this, but we're not going to. Because basically, I'm supposed to take about half an hour, which is almost half gone. <coughs> Already. So we're going to really just, I'm just going to hit some highlights here. <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk about these four types of battle fighters. We get to these descriptions in the center: the Zaylites, the Stai, the Princip, and the Triarch. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing them correct. The front of the line here is they're, fa is that they're facing this direction. Not this. They're not going this way. They're going this way. So the front line guys are here. The lights. Behind them, the Stai. Then Princip, then Triari. Let's take a look at each of those four. They like frontline guys, young javelin throwers. Come in their pajamas very much. A lot of armor here. Basic weapons. You can see up here, they're the young, inexperienced soldiers. Sounds kind of counterintuitive to put your inexperienced people up front. Romans thought, you need to get some battle experience, so we're going to make sure that you participate in the battle, so we're going to put you up front. So you'll be the first guys to face the enemy. And it's mostly about javelins, although they are carrying uh, the gladius. Uh, there's a model over here. Uh, you know, this is not people stuff yet, but uh, you just kind of see the basic weapons are carrying. The basic shield. And again, you'll see some of this transmogrified and other things as we go along. So these are kind of your basic guys. Not cannon fodder, but it is do or die. This is learning on the fly. You figure it out or not, you're straight on the battlefield. So we start out with these guys, uh, put them in the front. Um, they throw their spears. Once that's happened, pretty much they run to the back, which is what I would do. <laughs> Behind them, so they're softening up the enemy. Behind them, the Histadi. This is your second line. Now this, they, they are now the first line. They're, they're going back. The Histadi are going to wait until they get about 100 feet or so from the enemy. That's a third of a football field. Not that far. How long we give you this for 50? 50 feet? 150? 150? Well, then how much? Our, this room is 120 feet long. 40 yards. 40, uh, this room is 100. It's 40 yards long. You know, okay. Then they're that close. Okay, so we're pretty close. Uh, by the way, uh, 100 feet. Uh, if we were using uh, muskets in the 18th century, uh, you'd be too close. But anyway. Uh, so they also throw their uh, their javelins. Then they draw their swords, and then they will charge. Not going back, they're charging forward. And again, you're looking at guys that are pretty thinly protected here, kind of got the helmet going, sort of, got the breeze at least on the cheeks, a little bit of shield, um, which is one thing that Romans really do is the, the Greeks kind of had these smaller round shields. The, the Romans were got the rectangular shields for more protection. Again, not much in the way of armor at all, not much protection here. Throw, this, throw the javelin and then charge the enemy. And again, you're trying to soften up and completely discourage and rout out the army. Then your third guys, the princes. These are the best ones. Uh, these are the guys better armed. If the charge doesn't succeed, uh, then they will, uh, they study. If the charge doesn't succeed, then they will leave the field, go back then you're going to see them reform again back in the back of the army. So then you've got this line coming up. These are your most fierce guys, well-armed, Gladius going, um, Gladius here, Helen here, uh, the short sword. Uh, again, a larger shield. These, these are the guys you don't want, if you're the enemy, you don't want to be facing line first. Okay? 
by then, by this point, look, you, the point here is, in part, you've not used your entire army all at once. The enemy has. Presumably, they're, they're exhausted at this point. They've faced technically one army, then a second army, then a third army, and of course, there's a fourth one uh, in waiting as well. So every time there's an engagement, they, as the engagement continues, uh, you've got another group that's facing the same, the same enemy. Triari are the most experienced. These are some of the older guys, been down the road a bit, uh, done this before. They're the wealthiest, which usually means they can afford better weapons and armor. So they've kind of got the breastplate going on here, got the legs covered, the helmet. Uh, they've got uh, the gladius going on, on the shield. Again, this is something they would pay for out of the pocket. So these are the experienced. Uh, best, best, best protected guys, uh, they spent some money on this stuff. Often in these battles, these guys don't even see fight. Never get to the they, They've had their opportunity. They, they've proven they're, 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 they're fighting them already. So they're there just in case, uh, but often it doesn't get to them. So uh, they, they don't sweat a lot during these fights. Now that's the basic kind of Republican uh, way that they're going to fight on the field. Now, Roman cavalry. One thing that came out of the March of the 10,000, by the way, uh, because they didn't have cavalry, was Alexander the Great figured out, as he several decades later, oh, hey, wait a minute, if we use the phalanx and, and heavy cavalry uh, to wash the perimeter and to also charge into the enemy's lines or break the interior lines, then it will go even better. So well, that's one thing that allowed Alexander the Great to succeed so well is he brings all these units together, infantry, cavalry, and even artillery to the point meaning he's got Alexander the Great's got these sling guys, and you know, the slings and kind of thing. And you see these uh, sling bolts down the uh, zip. So uh, Roman cavalry, yes. Um, not a lot of it. They, the Romans never really rely on cavalry much. If the Romans really remain, tell, tell me if I'm wrong, the Romans really remain infantry kinds of guys. It's really mostly about the infantry. Uh, cavalry is kind of, yeah, okay, sure, yeah, we'll get it too. But they never rely that much on cavalry. You can see, for example, here, um, because Roman cavalry just never really performs that well, they a lot of times will uh, sort of farm that out somebody else. So we'll do the, uh, the Gauls or the uh, folks in Roman Africa. Okay, here's some basic Roman tactics. And a lot of these are just logical, just kind of common sense. And these will be, a lot of these will be true for armies throughout almost all of history. Okay? Romans preferred to fight in a higher position than the enemy. Sure. Almost any army wants that. You want to be on the high ground. It's true in the medieval era, it's true at the Battle of Crecy in the Hundred Years' War, it's true in uh, battles in the Civil War, it's true in World War I, uh, it's true in a lot of wars, and you want the high ground. If the enemy relied heavily on their cavalry, then the Romans want to try and arrange a battle site where there's rocky ground to mess up the horses. Okay? A lot of the enemy doesn't shod their horses. Romans will, by the way. Uh, so you get on crummy ground uh, just to screw up the horses. Then uh, Roman commanders like to ensure that the sun and the wind are behind their soldiers so you don't have the sun in your eyes. The wind's not blowing on you because you get dust, things like that. Yeah, that's just kind of logical. And a lot of our reason that uh, in future battles and future wars we rely on the same thing. The Romans are very good, by the way, at siege tactics. In the museum, you've seen the Oninger. Which, by the way, that is a replica. There are no original Hunters around. You never find any. They don't exist. So, really good at siege tactics. If you know about Masada and those kinds of things, uh, then you know where Jerusalem, uh, the siege of Jerusalem, then you know they are really good at siege tactics. They rely on the catapulta, the Oninger, like we have downstairs, and then the ballista. This is a spear you don't want to get on the wrong side of, for sure. Um, but they're good at lobbing stuff at walls and, and, uh, and uh, tearing down walls, breaking down the walls, and then they can ride in and watch the back of where it might be. 
Uh, to also approach walls as they lay siege, uh, they're going to use these build these wooden shed kinds of things to cover over them and make them roll that forward and get in underneath it. Uh, then you've also got, um, because a lot of these walls would have um, moats, we call moats later on, around them, ditches. So you want to get those partially filled in at some spot, spots where they can cross over and then they can start pulling down the walls. Okay. Uh, once the ditch is filled in, uh, then they bring in the ram, which actually has a ram's head on it. Uh, yeah, that's what John touched on. Uh, and they just start, you know, battering the door down. Uh, also, too, because the closer they get to the walls, they got to protect their soldiers, so they had this tactic called the testudo, which means tortoise, and you see obviously why. Because they take their shields, from the front, guys in the middle are covering over the heads, and they would do this all the way around, so they were just completely covered up in this in kind of hedgehog sort of position. So that's all a defensive tactic, because the arrows come, you know, streaming down on them. Not a lot of fighting at sea. The Romans like to fight on land. Uh, but they do. They do because sometimes they have to. Sometimes they have an enemy that's off away from the Italian peninsula. So if you go to them, you gotta go by sea. Uh, there's a few battles, I think, that matter. And you can see them listed here. Uh, the 260, 56, 241, that's all uh, Punic War battles. First Punic War, that is the only two or the three of them, that's the first one which is from the 260s to the 40s. Uh, when, when the First Punic War began, the Romans didn't even have a good, what we would call a naval vessel. They can't. They didn't know how to build it. They didn't know anything about it. Uh, fairly early in the First Punic War, uh, there will be a Carthaginian trireme, as we see here. The three the rows of rowers, which was the rowers on the ship, okay? Run ground off the coast of Syracuse, the Romans will get a hold of it, measure it out, build it, and hundreds of them. Copy off somebody else. Copy off the enemy. Basically. Otherwise they didn't know what how to do, how to do warfare. But here's the cool thing they do to adapt to this. They will add this thing called a corvus. You're seeing it here. This is uh, this is basically a, a, a platform. When they get close enough to the enemy ship, then they'll cut the rope, drop it down, and then it will have a nail or spike on the end of it, and it will hopefully stick into the ship's deck, the enemy ship's deck. Then they've got a, oh, a bridge. And they can cross from their ship to the enemy ship, and then basically it becomes another land kind of battle, but you can see. They're not really engaging in naval battle as such. Uh, so some of that happened, and again, that's, that's a pretty cool innovation, I think. I was a much more cool. So they adapt. Okay, uh, that's me at 7.30, hitting it really quickly, and that's getting kind of down and dirty and hitting, uh, hitting the highlights. Again, there's a whole lot of detail in between we just don't have time for. I'm going to hand it over to LT here. He's going to cover, I've been taking kind of the uh, macro view, He's now going to give you kind of the individual soldier kind of thing. Is that what we're going to do? I think so. We're still making this up, even now. We still got a half hour. Yes. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually going to talk without the mic, if that's okay. Can anybody hear? I'm actually going to talk without it. Uh, one, because we um, move around and we're going to be picking up some of this stuff here in a second. We'll have to be fighting with the microphone. Uh, a couple things to start with when we talk about the Roman army, as, as Dad said a minute ago, for the vast majority of the time of the Roman army, they're a heavy infantry oriented army. And so that idea that we think of, of the Roman legionary with, with the helmet, uh, the armor here, which we'll talk about in a minute, you know, the, the heavy shield, the, the scutum, uh, the sword, all that kind of thing, uh, for the most part, that's really what they focused on, that's what they were good at. Um, not to digress too far, but if you think about the image that was up a few minutes ago of the Greek phalanx and the, the, the Greeks in that, that square formation, they got their, their shields, they got their sarissa, there's a long uh, a pike, a long spear, 22, 21 foot, depending on the, the different model. If you think about that, 
that kind of formation, that's great. That, that's a great battle formation if you got somebody in front of you. I know it's a song, it's just my tongue. That's not intended to be a joke, but if you think about it, that doesn't work real well if somebody comes at you from the side. Especially if you're on the non shielded side. Does that make sense? You look at that diagram, the Greeks, just like the Romans, forced everyone to be right handed. You were left handed. Sorry. The world is right handed. <laughs> In that kind of formation, you have all your, your spears, your scris towards the front. You engage the enemy, you can stab and do all those things, you can push. But if you have an enemy from the side, that becomes problematic very quickly. That is one of the reasons why the Romans um, looked at this. They fought against the Greeks in this formation a number of times. They thought, hey, that's great and all, but let's do something else. Because once you get oriented with that phalanx, can it pivot? Just like Dad mentioned, absolutely. Is that easy to do on the fly? When thousands and thousands of people are screaming, you have metal on metal, metal on wood, banging together, you're wearing a, a helmet that at best has cutouts like that around a year. How do you control that when people are coming from different directions? You don't. Which is why very quickly the Romans are able to overcome this and they adapt their tactics, they come up with something else. Essentially what they do against the Greek phalanx, because the phalanx was dominant for many, many years um, in the basically 500 up to mid 200 BC, phalanx is a thing. If you didn't have a phalanx, you weren't going to win. Essentially, the Romans look at that and go, I see your cute phalanx. Watch this. We're going to come at you on the other side. Um, essentially, the Romans would take sections of their infantry and split them into blocks. And there would be gaps between those blocks. 50, 100 yard gaps. <laughs> the idea being, as that line comes forward, it's not a solid line half mile wide. It's a block of men in, in a century, maybe a cohort, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then there's a gap. And then there's the next century of cohort. And the next one, the next one, there's those gaps. The reason being is, as they approach that phalanx, the phalanx has to make a decision. What is it? There's guys on this side, there's guys on this I can only flip one way at a time, right? And the way the, the phalanx worked is, everybody faced the same direction or else it doesn't work at all. So you have the Greek, or whoever's using the phalanx has to make a decision. The Orient run one way, the Roman can, uh, contingent can face that, and the adjacent Roman contingent across that gap says, now I have your side, I have your point, essentially. If there's shielded side, that's bad enough. Think about the other end of this picture. Those guys are exposed on that right hand side. Yeah, very, very dangerous. Your highest casualties in that formation and in Roman formations is on the right because they're on the There's nobody past them into that line. So if you have one, one formation coming at your side, one from the other side, that's very quickly how the Romans were able to overcome this and then they adapt to two other tactics later on. Uh, again, as, as Dad said, you start off with those different entities there, those different types of soldiers, the militates, the principal phase, the, the study, all that kind of stuff. Um, they eventually remove all of those because all of those different types of soldiers require that the soldiers basically provide their own equipment, as I said. So the scumbag men, the militates, you know, the javelin throwers, might have dad's helmet at best, might have a shield, a couple javelins, that's about it. You know, the last line, the triarii, you know, the, the landed men, they have the plantations, that kind of thing, uh, business men. They're the one that can afford all the, the armor, the larger shield armies. But by the time you get to the, you know, the second century, or, uh, BC, the Romans decide, you know what, we're done with all that. We're just going to have one type of soldier, essentially. That's going to be the legionary that we think of now. And that comes about because the Romans decide, we're not going to require everybody to, to bring your own equipment. Don't worry about bringing your own sword, we'll give you one. The catch is, is you've got to pay for it out of your So, <laughs> so the, uh, the Romans, the legionaries very quickly figured out, hey, I've got to take care of this. Uh, my helmet, my armor, my, my shield, my sword. I've got to take care of all that. Is it, I break it? If I lose it? Comes out of my paycheck. Depending on the, the arrow, uh, depending on the, 
geographic location where they were stationed. Um, you know, sometimes your equipment didn't last as long in certain environments as opposed to others. So you might be having to replace all these buckles every couple months. That comes out of your picture. You gotta keep your, your arm exact. Uh, which leads to an interesting aside. We get used to, um, as people in modern day, we get used to pictures like, let me go back a couple slides. We get used to pictures like this, right? Anybody seen Gladiator? Great, I love that movie. Uh, there's, some, there's some inaccuracies in it, but still, just for a, a film, love that movie. We get used to images like this, uh, where everything's uniform, right? Everybody has the same type of helmet, glare, everybody has the same type of armor. This, um, it's called Lorica Segmentata. Uh, the term segment, that's, that's why that's called that. Uh, essentially, we get used to this idea of everybody looks the same. It's 100% uniform. That's easy for us to, to think of because that's what we're conditioned to now. Because if you look at soldiers now, or those of you that may have served in the, the military, everyone looks the same, right? Every, the equipment is the same. That's a rather modern convention. That didn't exist in the Roman period. So to have an image like this of, of actual people would be very, very rare. We get used to uh, thinking, especially in the first century AD, uh, this type of armor, you know, that's, that's the Roman armor. That's just what we think of when we see it. But in reality, for each man wearing this, there's a 50-50 chance the guy next to him is wearing a 100-year-old chainmail. Why? Because it still works. There's nothing wrong with it. It's heavy, but there's nothing wrong with it. It still works. And just because that's the latest, greatest thing that Publius next to me is wearing, I, I don't want to pay for that. It comes out of my pay. I'm going to keep this chain mail. It, it still works. This helmet I have, yeah, it's not the, the most recent design. It's 50 years old. It's got eight other guys' names scrawled in it. <laughs> uh, that's not uncommon. But they kept using it because it was still effective. They had to pay for it otherwise. So again, we get past these, these different or differentiations of the, the Roman soldiers. Again, the Hastati, the Principes, the Triarii, all that kind of thing. And we get down to, again, a more uniform concept of soldier, but their equipment did, did vary at times. Um, in addition to the normal things that we think of, the, the weapons, the armor, we'll talk about in a second, uh, understand that some of the reforms with the Roman army after about 100 BC, uh, they're not only carrying these kind of things, they're carrying a whole bunch of other stuff, is what's in that lower left picture. Uh, you see that, um, that spike, basically, uh, wooden spike. Everybody is carrying one or two of those. That way, at night, when the column stops marching, they make their camp for the evening. Everybody embeds that spike facing out, and that helps set up the defensive perimeter. That's one of the reasons why uh, the Romans were rather secure each night when they stopped the camp, is because you have things like that. It's not always mules carrying that, it's the individual men carrying that. You know, all the little things you see, um, variations of those uh, items you see in that picture, you know, the canteen, um, the, the cloak, the clasps here, the spoons, the you know, decorative armbands, that kind of thing, a sponge. Yeah, it's fortunate. <laughs> Everybody's got to have their own. Uh, all that stuff you care. In addition to the 65 plus pounds of all of these things. So I, I don't want to overlook that because that's absolutely essential. It's one of the reasons why they're successful is because what normally is carried by, by wagons, mules, horses, a lot of that stuff's being carried by the men themselves. And so the Roman army on the march becomes much more effective because they're able to carry a lot of those things themselves. Uh, as far as some of the individual equipment, you see the picture here, um, it's legionary wearing the, um, the type of helmet. It's, if you really want to get, uh, really like to nerd out on that kind of stuff, it's an Imperial Gaelic helmet uh, from the first century AD. Uh, the point is, is that a lot of times the Romans would work. They did all kinds of construction projects. The vast majority of legionaries, they built a whole lot more than they ever fought. Um, most of you are familiar um, with the concept of, of aqueducts, you know, the Colosseum, theaters all over the, the Mediterranean world. Well, who built all that stuff? 
these guys. Well, I because he didn't have a choice, really. A lot of roads. Yeah, a lot of roads. All those roads are, are built by these guys. Um, one, it gives them something to do. So if you're the emperor and you've got 150,000 legionaries spread out across your empire, and I don't want those guys to get bored. I do need a new road through Syria, so hey, uh, fellas, while you're sitting out there in the desert, why don't you build me a road? What choice do you have? No. On a more basic level, though, that kind of appealed to them because why? If I'm serving under the standard, as they say, if I'm serving in the Roman army and I'm blazing a new road, laying down something permanent, or this road's going to be here for hundreds of years, if I'm laying down that road, does that make me feel good as a soldier? I'm advancing the, the, the cause of the empire? Sure. So, to an extent, while they're doing all these construction projects, it wasn't, it wasn't like they complained all the time. I'm sure, you know, sure they got tired, they got hot, they got thirsty. But to an extent, you're, you're expanding the empire. And that's, that appeals to a lot of these guys. Uh, I bring that up because you see this picture. This soldier is obviously without what? Got to have his armor. It wasn't uncommon for the soldiers when they would go out during the day after working on a project, building a road, building an aqueduct. You would wear your belt, because your belt held your sword. You gotta have that. You might have your helmet, you might not, depending on what you're doing. Um, but it wasn't uncommon to go without your armor while you're on those, those uh, construction projects. They trained all the time in armor, out of armor, with their equipment, I mean, without the shield all kinds of different tactics just so that they're ready at a moment's notice. So the idea we have of always having this entire get up with my shield, maybe, maybe not. Depends on the source. Um, I mentioned the belt a second ago. The belt is a huge deal. That belt, um, there's different variations of it. Uh, there wasn't one pattern for it. Essentially, you just think of a leather belt that is able to hold your your pupio, your dagger, like this. On the other side would be your gladius, short stabbing sword. This based off of the uh, Iberian swords, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal now. Um, that's where the Romans got the idea since my dad said they stole it. Um, this is a uh, Iberian design. But you want that belt because you have to have your weapons with you at all times. It also was a mark of distinction. If you saw a man walking and they were wearing this belt, and they're, they have the Pukio and the Gladius, you knew immediately that was a soldier. That was a big deal. Because if you're a soldier, if you're a legionary, you're a citizen. And some of you know from, from uh, different stories, uh, there's stories in the Bible of how important Roman citizenship was in that time. So absolutely, if I'm, if I'm away from my unit, if I'm walking out of the camp, going into town for whatever reason, I'm going to have that belt on, regardless of what I'm doing. I'm not actually on duty, so to speak, but I'm going to have that on, because that shows people that's, that's a huge deal. You can't, you can't, can't overstate how, how big, of a, big of a deal that was. For the legionaries, um, some of you may be familiar with, when these guys signed on, originally it was for a 16-year commitment, um, that eventually expands up to 20 and eventually 25. So, again, yeah, if there's a, a number of uh, military veterans in the room, you know, so we might have somebody who went you know, 20 years of retirement, is what it is now. That's great. Saying that's not a modern concept. That was around in the Roman. Um, and oddly enough, even if your enlistment was 25 years, they only rotated people out every other year. So just if you got um if you came in on an odd number year, they only rotate people out on an even number year. So you actually have to serve twenty six. That's the way it was. Nobody complained. It's it's what happens. Yeah. One of the other ways the Roman army was so effective was their training. The uh, Jewish historian Josephus talks about uh, I guess famous quote. We talked about the uh, the Roman army and how they approached uh, battle, how they approached training. And he said, in effect, that their battles are bloody drills, and the drills are bloodless battles. Uh, because they took that training so seriously. Um, most uh, legions worked on an eight-day training cycle. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't think of days like we do, Sunday, Monday, and so on. It was 
what is today. Today's our 25 mile hike. I don't know, last time you hiked 25 miles, it's been a while for me, um, especially wearing all of this stuff. But when they did that, it was wearing all of you who was carrying everything you issued just to continue to build up the body of shooting conditions. We would have another day that would be uh, weapons training. Look at what you're seeing here. We have guys get paired off uh, based off skill, you know, and you're using wooden weapons for the most part. It's kind of hard to tell in the picture, but uh, the gladius uh, that they're holding, the scoots on the shield they're holding, those are made of wood. And generally those would double weight of the actual item, just to build up the muscles more. Um, it sounds terrible, you're out there for hours at a time, you know, whacking at each other with a, a double weight set of weapons, but that's that's one of the things they did to continue to toughen the body, build up those muscles so that when you get into battle, you have the endurance to fight all the time. Um, think about a lot of the battles that we, you know, we have historical records of. In this period, most of them weren't over in a half hour. A lot of those lasted all day. <clears throat> so you think about how is that even possible? What that means is, is that at some point they're breaking off. You may be in heavy combat for a period, and then the entire unit, maybe talking about hundreds of thousands of men, breaks off. You might just sit down and have a meeting. And the enemy is right, they're right there. You could yell at each other back and forth a lot of time. But you, you can take a step back, take a deal, get back up, okay, we're ready to go, swarm back up, you go again. And you can have that cycle over, over, over. It's just mind boggling to me to think you're, you're that close, you stab someone in the face, but then you know what, we're going to take a break. <laughs> we'll be back in a minute. And you, can, you have that set, that's just mind boggling. Um, in addition to the, uh, the double-weighted weapons, the formations, you see a, a basic group here of uh, of eight legionaries. That is the smallest unit, but we can think of the modern term of the squad. Uh, they call it a comfort party. Uh, it means tenting together. Um, essentially, those eight men, once you were assigned to that group, you're with those guys until you either get out in 25 years or you get out. So you can imagine um, the, how close they were, that idea of, of comradeship, how, how you know, literally uh, how tangible an idea that was, because you're living with, you're fighting with these people every day for 25 years. Uh, Roman uh, soldiers were officially not supposed to marry, a lot of them did, officially, uh, but you were supposed to. So the only people you were living with day after day are those other seven men you were tent Just that's amazing to me to be that close to people, you know, working every day, fighting periodically. You know, it didn't happen every day, but fighting so often and so often. But to have that same group day after day after day. Um, you know, some some people you, you work with the same uh, same coworkers for a while, you know, 63 semesters or whatever. <laughs> that, that's a long time, right? But that's a little different, what we do now, right? We meet somebody at work, we all go home to our own place. No, they're literally sharing a tent for a period of 25 years. Uh, and it's as, uh, as diverse a group as you can think of. Uh, there are historical records of men being recruited in what's now Egypt, a big station in what's now England. Uh, men who are recruited in Antolia, in the northern part of the uh, Think of like Northern Turkey and being stationed in North Africa. You might show up not knowing any of the local language, but you know what language you did learn really quick? Latin. Because in battle, that's what the Romans would use, is Latin. And if you missed the command of Pila Iocte to throw that, that pila or javelin, you not only you're going to look kind of silly, but you're not doing the job. You very quickly learned. Learn Latin, at least enough to, to get through the day and not get eaten by your superior officers. Bloody drills and bloodless battles. It's crazy how uh, how the historian put that. I'll show you just a couple uh, pictures here of some of these uh, barrack blocks. Um, you know, get an idea of what it looks like when these these guys are living together. It's dark. 
Um, doesn't smell real good. I mean, it's, it is what it is. You're the same people every day. Um, interestingly, interestingly enough, um, there's evidence of a lot of uh, uh, macular degeneration, you know, um, vision problems with Roman soldiers. A lot of times because they're living in these little barrack rooms with a fire going constantly for decades. And I just find that kind of thing fascinating. I do want to talk for a, a couple minutes about um, you know the different uh, ranks within the army. So ranks are not quite the same as what we think of now uh, with modern military ranks. Um, there is obviously a hierarchy, hierarchy, but it's not the same as what we think of uh, today. So um, you essentially have when you uh, when you join a legion, or you signed up for the Roman army. They sent you wherever they were going to send you, which you had no choice in. Um, didn't matter how long it took you. You received your your orders and you went to wherever you were assigned. You show up and you were what's called a probatio. That's uh, basically a think of probationary um, soldier, probationary legionary. Um, that's where you were, and they had the the idea of a basic training, and that took months. Um, one of the things that also stands out about the Romans is the idea of a professional army. As Dad said earlier, a lot of armies in the ancient world were kind of ad hoc. You know, the king's called, we got to go. By the time you get to the, the Romans, especially when you get to the late Republic and the Empire, it's a professional army. These guys have signed up for a long time. And they go in and basic training, and again, it's not 100% analogous, but the idea is similar. You come in and you learn how to, how to take care of your armor, how to maintain your equipment, how to utilize your, your sword and shield, how to throw the, the pilum or the javelin correctly. Uh, you learn how to, how to march, how to make your facing movements, all those kind of things. You do that over about a four month period. In addition, interestingly enough, the Romans taught everyone how to swim. Uh, regardless of where you were in the empire, they'd find a body of water somewhere and they'd get in there and learn how to swim. Uh, they also would teach the vast majority of legionaries how to use a sling. Um, so the sling, sling bolts or sling stones, yeah, I mentioned earlier, there's examples of down in the museum. Those are everywhere. Uh, essentially, if you find a place um, in an archaeological site where there, there were Roman soldiers, you will find those slings because everyone was taught how to use them. Um, they didn't use them every day, but you at least had that capability if they were new. I find that kind of thing fascinating because it shows a, an army who was... Um, not only just reactionary to the immediate threat, but thinking about how else can we train our men so that they can meet other threats in the future. Just, I find that kind of thing fascinating. Uh, if you survive your, uh, your probationary period, your, your basic training, those couple months, uh, you become a, a legionary. The vast majority of Roman soldiers stayed a legionary for that 25 or 26 years if you're under a lot. Most of them stayed hundreds of thousands of men. Um, if I ask you to picture what the Roman Empire looked like, a lot of you would, would picture the, the diagrams we've all seen, you know, maps, you know, a chart at, at Sunday school where you know, it's huge, right? The majority of the Mediterranean, from, from Egypt uh, to the Iberian Peninsula up to, to England, over to Thrace. We all can kind of picture that, the empire at its height, right? The vast majority of time, the Roman Empire army was never more than about 150,000 men over that entire area. That's a huge area for 100,000 men to, to cover. You had about an equal number of what they call auxiliaries, but as far as legionaries, what we think of, what we think of Roman soldiers, the most time was never more than about 150,000 total across that entire gigantic area. So that's fascinating. Uh, if you stay with the Legion, um, you survive, and you were good at your job, you became what's uh, called a immunist. Uh, essentially, it's um, think of the word immune, so you were exempt from having to do um, certain duties. So when the, uh, the centurion would come to you and say, hey, we need somebody to uh, go clean out the bathhouse, <laughs> not me. I'm a veteran, I'm, I'm immunist. Oh, you got to find somebody else. That was a highly coveted thing because that got you out of a lot of um, not so pleasant jobs uh, that an army has to do at that time. Uh, you show a little further skill, maybe you could read and write, uh, which is pretty rare. You could maybe become a, a standard bearer. We were carrying one of these, these types of standards. There's all kinds of different kinds of standards. 
But if you became a standard bearer, that was, a, that was an important job. Because the Roman army looked at those standards with almost religious significance. It's hard for us to, to think about things like that. Um, you know, for most people nowadays, we look at the flag, and we, you know, we feel a sense of patriotism and that kind of thing, which is absolutely great. But it's hard for us to understand truly how Roman soldiers looked at these kind of standards. To us, that's, yeah, that's great. It's cool. So we sign on it, and whatever. But to them, that was something to die for. It's just, it's hard to explain how, how they looked at that. In fact, most uh, permanent bases that the Romans had, especially on the Rhine, the Danube, and those was now Europe, they had a, a special temple that these would be held in during their winter quarters. And you would go and you make offerings to it, to Mars, Apollo, that could be your, your god of choice uh, within their, uh, their system. But they, again, almost religious significance to those standards. Uh, you served your 20, 25, 26 years, um, you survived. Uh, you had the opportunity, sometimes not of your choice, to become an evocate, which means you're a veteran. If you had served your entire enlistment, uh, the emperor needs to stay around for a little bit, so <laughs> come over into this unit of uh, veterans. Um, it was not uncommon at all that you get stuck in one of those for another five, six, ten years. It just kind of depends. Uh, for those, um, that's the, the basic Roman legionary. For those that uh, became officers, there were some different officers. It's maybe kind of hard for somebody in the back to see. Um, had different titles that they, uh, one that we're very, very familiar with, the centurion. Uh, there were others, again, the, the standard bearers, the optio. An optio is essentially the, the centurion's second in command. So the centurion dies, the optio is the one that takes over. Um, he lived with and trained with all the legionaries, but he's the guy that the centurion does. Uh, there also is another um, rank called the Tessarius. Uh, basically, he would think of like a sergeant today in, in modern militaries. Uh, he's the guy who has to get up in the middle of the night and go check and make sure everybody's still awake on the watch, that kind of thing. Um, that, that's his job. As you go up the ranks, you had um, five military tribunes. A lot of times those were young men, you know, the sons of uh, Roman senators. A lot of times these guys had no idea what they were doing. There was no formal training at that time. So you had five of these guys in, with each legion. So there were about 5,000 men, more or less, in the legion. Well, five of them were these tribunes, who were basically the rich sons of, of the poor people back in Rome. And they show up and, I'm, I'm an officer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take charge. Sometimes that worked out really well, sometimes that was horrible. Because again, they have absolutely no training. Uh, there just wasn't. You, you learned on the job or you died. You know, that's kind of how that went. Um, above that, you had what's called the legate or the legatus. Um, usually, the legate is a professional uh, man. He's there forever. Okay? Uh, the tribunes could pop in and out. They might be a tribune for a couple of years. They get bored and they go back home to their own whatever. With the legatus, he was a professional. He was one who was there uh, for the for the duration. You know? He might move from one legion to another, but that. That's a full-time officer. Then you have your generals, your commanders, those that we actually read about, you know, uh, Caesar, Marius, um, Scipio, kind of those kind of people. Those are, those are commanders who are, who are over multiple legions. Um, obviously, there's only a couple of those uh, for, for army. So. Um, again, very, very uh, interesting, I think, to think of these different, uh, different ranks. To kind of wrap up here, um, Talk about these different weapons. How do they how do they utilize these? Well, this sword again of, of uh, Iberian design. At that point, that's a stabbing sword. So the intent is, as I use this, I'm stabbing. The Romans were not trained to to slash or swing. Uh, you see that in the movie. That's wrong. They need to fire the uh, what do you call that? Uh, consultant. Yeah, I'm a consultant. Thank you. Uh, big. <laughs> That's the one. They didn't do it. This is stabbing sword. The idea being is I hold this system like this, then I hold that sword next to it, and I get it nice and tight. I don't have my arms stuck out. But we teach uh, our recruits in the state patrol uh, firearms. We tell them, don't chicken wing, don't shoot your arms out. Bring your arms in tight because you're stronger. Same kind of thing here. I bring that sword up right by my shield, and I have the guy next to me. I would, you know, Tom sitting right here in front of me, he was to my left, 
his sword will be right next to my shield to the left. And if Tim was here to my right, his shield would be just my right. You're literally on top of each other. But there's enough gap so that as I advance, I can still stab forward. I don't want to stab too far forward. If I get my arm way out here, I get my arm cut off. I'm going to stay nice and tight. Step forward and recover that sword. Step forward and recover that sword. At the same time, these shields uh, are much heavier than this. This uh, replica here. You see this boss, this metal boss here in the middle. The idea with that is, when the enemy gets close enough, I can push them. I can hit them with them. I might try and hit high. Put them off balance just enough so that I have the ability to stab and recover that sword. That kind of point, um, made to a razor point, is going to make some pretty, pretty deep wounds. That's, that's the part of the home, that's the point. Um, <laughs> because if you, especially if you're stabbing up into the rib cage, if I come up underneath into the rib cage, then I have a better chance of hitting the heart of the lungs, the whole cardiovascular system. Um, kind of important stuff there. You can, you can slash, and it might look bad, it might be bloody, but it may not be. Whereas if you're stabbing into that torso, much, much more dangerous to, to the uh, recipient. Uh, with this shield, you know, again, they're nice and heavy. I get in close, I can drop it down on someone's foot, then put them off balance or have them react to that. If they react to the pain, they drop their shield. So if I get in close, they lean forward to attack me. I bring the shield up, get the bottom of the chin, get it exposed to the neck, that kind of thing. I can stab high. That's the whole point of that. Um, the Roman soldiers would spend hours and hours and hours hitting a wooden post. You probably, some of you make some push. Hitting a wooden post. And just, the whole idea is you're building up those muscles and you're trying to teach that idea of maximize your, your coverage here, your shield. Is that sword here nice and tight? And stab. Mind numbing hours of stabbing at, at a post. But, the trade-off is, when you get into battle, it becomes uh, what they call muscle memory. You don't have to think about it. I have that target in front of me, I stab. I stab. Yes, sir? Uh, I noticed that when you stab, you go flat like that. And that kind of got me through some of the Potentially. Potentially. The, uh, you know, some of the enemies that Roman's face had, had Pretty good armor, very equivalent to what they're wearing. Others didn't really have any. Um, the point is, if you say, the point with the stab is, is that you get as much of that point into the person as you can. Even uh, chainmail, that stuff can be very, uh, very beneficial. It can protect pretty well. If you stab hard enough on a weak point, you may be able to get it. So even enemies who are wearing armor can still be. Last thing to wrap up here is the I think that is a, take that as a sign. The javelin here, the, the pilum, uh, most of these carries would carry two. They varied in length. One of the cool things they did was um, have a couple, a couple rivets here, so that way once I throw this thing, when it impacts on the other side, just because of the weight of it, it serves to break, and so the handle falls off. Whoever I threw this at, if I didn't impale with them, maybe they got lucky and they stopped with the shield. Now they've got this spike sticking out of the shield. It makes that shield a little more unwieldy. They stop a couple of them, and eventually it becomes too heavy, maybe they just drop it. Now my enemy, when I give him the sword range, they don't have a shield. But it benefits me. Um, other armies did you know, try to copy the Romans, but they were really the first one to use that kind of rivet so it would fall apart. The other benefit is if the handle falls off, your enemy can't pick it up and throw it back. So all that's left is the point. Uh, interesting innovation. Um, I'm going to stop there a little bit over time.